but it is not the same ADI that you learned for elliptic problems. Okay, so this is called time splitting ADI method. In fact, you know, people who, who do CFD calculations, they are more familiar with this method than the other, other ADI method that, that we've already learned in class, okay? <clears throat> so essentially, it follows the idea of ADI being that, you know, we are going to do row-wise sweeps and column-wise sweeps. That basic idea is still uh, intact, but this is for transient calculations, okay? And there are several variations of the algorithm that have been uh, proposed in the past. The first one was in 1955 by Peaceman and Rackford. And uh, then uh, this guy, Douglas, he took over this work. And in 1956, he extended the method to 3D. And then finally, in 1964, he generalized this method. Okay, so in the very first method, this one, if you read the paper, uh, you will see that what they have done is they have split a time step into two parts, okay? And then they, in one part, they do a row-wise sweep, and in the other part, they do a column-wise sweep, all right? Uh, and then here, he split the time step into three parts, and, and you don't, you know, you do constant I, constant J, and constant K sweeps. And then finally here, uh, Douglas and Gunn, they came up with a method where they say, really you can do arbitrary number of time splits within one time step and do arbitrary number of sweeps, okay? And that's the most general uh, approach to doing this, okay? But today what we're going to do is uh, talk about, talk about <clears throat> the douglas Rackford method, which is this one here, but for 2D, okay? This one is slightly more complicated mathematically, so I'm not going to get into that here. We'll just stay with the this version. Actually, this version is probably the more popular one. Okay. So here's the original reference, if you're interested. Um, as you can see, the title says, on the numerical solution of heat conduction problems in two and three space variables. Okay. Uh, so they developed this with the idea of solving heat conduction problems. Um, although it is published in a mathematics journal, Transactions of the American Mathematical Society, okay? The method is implicit in time, as you will see. So this is not an explicit method. It is an implicit method, okay? <clears throat> so here is what they proposed. They said that we split the time advancement into two steps, okay? So this is the discrete equation that you're familiar with, except you know, we have introduced this new symbol called phi star. Typically, if you go to the backward Euler method, you will see phi i j n plus one. Now, of course, here I've used subscript n instead of superscript that I've been using uh, until now, so that so as you know, not to have the star collide with the superscript. Okay, I've moved the n down to the subscript just so you don't get confused. So this n here stands for time index still. Okay. So if you go to the backward Euler method, you will see that instead of this term here, you will have a phi i, j, n plus one, okay? And then here you will have all these terms here will be i uh, at n plus one, and that's, that's it, that's your equation, and you solve it, okay? Here, what they did was, they said, well, how about we treat the x derivative explicit, uh, implicitly the y derivative explicitly in time, okay? So notice that here I have a phi star, okay? On the left, I have a phi star minus old time step, and these are all at the old time step. So this is old, this is current, okay? And this one, you can think of as an approximate solution to the current time step. Why approximate? Because it's still treating one term at the old time step, okay? It's not the actual implicit equation that you would get for the backward Euler method, okay? Then they said, well, we, we get an approximate solution. Now we are going to correct it, okay? So we are going to use another step here where I'm going to take the approximate solution and correct it. And the right-hand side here, you can see it's uh, quite a bit different from what you have in the in the in this equation here okay notice that both are y derivatives okay and 
<clears throat> so what they did was they said well um, this equation I'm going to solve using a tridiagonal solver this equation also I'm going to solve using a tridiagonal solver so I've split the whole solution into two steps okay uh, mathematically what does that do in other words if I add up these two equations do I get the backward Euler method back that's what I should be getting if everything has been done correctly okay so and notice that both both of these steps are implicit in time because here I have you know phi star i j phi star i plus 1 j phi star i minus 1 j and so on so it is an implicit equation same thing here I have phi i j n plus 1 and then I have all the n plus 1's on the right hand side also so it's an implicit set of equations. So ideally, if we add the two time steps, we should recover what we have for the backward Euler method. Because these two equations were developed by splitting the backward Euler formula. Okay? But when you add them up, this is what you end up getting. Okay? You can clearly see here, this term and that term cancels out, and you get this plus that on the right-hand side. Okay, and then of course the this one and that one cancels out, and you get this minus that on the left hand side. So on the left hand side we have recovered our backward Euler time discretization. On the right hand side, however, the y derivative is implicit. The x derivative has this phi star. It doesn't have the n plus one. Okay, when we add the two equations. So then once you do that, then comes the question. What's the error? If so, if I did the time splitting, splitting, obviously I'm not solving the backward Euler equation anymore. So the question is, what's the difference between the backward Euler method and this method in terms of how much new error it introduces? Okay. So to do that so what what are the implications of this modification we perform taylor series expansions to answer that question so what we are going to do now is we are going to take this guy these guys and perform functions okay backward taylor series expansions in time okay notice that this is n plus 1 all here and then there is a minus delta t okay And so this et cetera that I said here is because you got to do the same Taylor series expansions for J my, or, uh, I plus 1 and I minus 1. Here I have only done Ij, but you can do the same Taylor series expansions. You can replace Ij with I plus 1J or with I minus 1J. So you'll get three Taylor series expansions. Okay, And when you add those and basically construct this term here, okay. this is what you end up getting so instead of this I plugged in the three Taylor series expansions on the previous page which give us that because that's the first term in each of the Taylor series expansions as you can see okay like that term and then in addition you get all these extra terms that I have in red here okay so this is my backward Euler formula that I want, that I had already. That already has some temporal error, discretization error in time. Okay. In addition, by doing the time splitting, I've introduced this new error. All right. So the question is, what 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 is the you know what does that error look like? So one of the things we can do is look at that extra term a little bit more closely okay <clears throat> so this term we can use our central difference formula notice that for example d phi dt we can write as just another function g okay so this is nothing but g i plus 1 comma j minus 2 g i j plus g I minus 1 comma J okay so what is that that is nothing but so that divided by Delta X square is nothing but 
d squared g dx squared. That's our finite difference approximation, central difference. Okay which is what I've written here. I've multiplied through by delta x squared, and then my g is that guy, okay? So I have uh, d squared g dx squared, and then that's our higher order, our leading error term, fourth derivative, okay? So it's the fourth derivative of the function g that we introduced here with delta x to the fourth over 12 in front of it, okay? So this is the... Uh, uh, the central difference formula, okay? So, <clears throat> so with that, I can plug that into my error expression, and my error expression becomes that, okay? So I have plugged that expression, this guy here, this guy, into into here, this expression, okay, and that gives me that. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take my governing equation, which I'm solving, plug it into that expression, okay. So instead of this term here, I'm going to use this right-hand side, all right? Because I want to eliminate all the all time derivatives from the error expression. Just have spatial derivatives, okay? And this is what you end up getting. So of course, these have the d4 phi dx4, but there are also cross derivatives which show up, okay? But at the end of the day, what you see is this guy here. A delta t in front, okay. which basically means that this additional error that we introduced by splitting in time is also first order in time. Okay, so our original scheme was first order in time. This additional error is also first order in time. So essentially, we still have a scheme that is first order in time. The exact expression for the error is obviously different from the backward Euler method, and the exact numbers that will come out will be slightly different. Okay but they will scale in the same manner as backward Euler. So in backward Euler, if we have the time step, we have the error. Here also, if we have the time step, it will have the error. Okay? So that's the basic idea of the uh, time splitting ADI method. It's a, it's a, if you come to think of it, again, going back to the problem that I was talking about, it's a very elegant method because First of all, you have an implicit method, so there are no time step restrictions, okay? Secondly, within each time step, you're not having to do any iteration at all. You're just doing row-wise sweep, column-wise sweep, you're done with that time step, okay? Then you move on to row-wise sweep, column-wise sweep, done with the next time step, okay? So this whole thing that I was talking about earlier that the workload you put in is the number of iterations per time step times the number of time steps. That's all gone here because all you're doing is basically one iteration, one row-wise sweep, one column-wise sweep per time step, okay? But at the same time, this is not like an explicit method. Remember, explicit method, we had, we also said we don't, don't need any matrix inversion, nothing, just one explicit calculation per node and we are there. Uh, idea is same, but it's an implicit method, no time step, time step restrictions, okay? So this is one of the most popular methods for structured meshes uh, for transient calculations, okay? Uh, people also use it in the context of the Crank-Nicholson method. So you can formulate the same time splitting the two steps using the Crank-Nicholson equation. Okay, here we formulated it using the backward Euler equation, but you can also formulate it using the Crank-Nicholson formula. You'll get something very similar. Okay, again, two steps, one row-wise, one column-wise sweep, and that's it, okay? So pretty unique method uh, in terms of computational efficiency because it's unconditionally stable, but fairly computationally cheap, okay? Any questions? Yeah. When you said uh, there's no time step restrictions, did you mean the size? 
the size of the time step. Yeah. So because it's both steps are implicit and therefore they're unconditionally stable. So what benefits does time splitting bring to the table? Well, here are your steps. You can write them as follows. Okay. And clearly you can see that the first equation, if I write it in this form, this is nothing but a tridiagonal equation. Okay. Row wise tridiagonal solve. Second step, again, uh, tridiagonal equation, column wise tridiagonal solve. Okay. Very, very cheap. Very little memory involved. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I'm confused how we got the second equation actually. Okay. So the second equation is constructed in such a way that, so you can see here, um, let's see, that's not the slide I wanted to be on. Yeah. So. Let me just wipe all this out. So now if you ask me how did they come up with this, okay, well, they're smart people, they were thinking forward, okay. But what they did was, and you can see it here, is they said, well, I have the y derivative here, the x derivative here, okay, and they now said that the y derivative here is explicit in time. But I want an implicit scheme. So I don't want any explicit terms on the right hand side. So what am I going to do in the second step? I'm going to actually cancel it out. Okay. So you see here in the second step, they have two y derivatives. One at the current time step, this one negative at the previous time step. So this term and that term cancels out when you add the two equations. Okay. So on the right hand side, what do you have then? You have the x derivative and the y derivative when you add the two equations. Only difference is this y derivative is 100% implicit. This is not 100% implicit. There is an error there because it's at an intermediate approximate solution. Okay. So now if you ask me, well, how did they come up with this? They fooled around with the equations, wrote them down. So it's kind of like what smart people do. They think bottom up and then top down and somewhere things join hands. They knew what they wanted and then they kind of figured out how the equations should be set up so it works. And the reverse engineering. Exactly. So it's partly forward engineering, partly reverse engineering. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, so so as I was saying, so it's just two tridiagonal solves, uh, very easy to set up. Uh, one thing I, I forgot to mention in the last class is if we go back to our um, equations, okay, let's talk about this equation, for example, all right? So suppose you have developed a steady state code, a tridiagonal solver for the Laplacian equation, which you have done already for, I believe, homework three, it was, or homework four, maybe, okay? Yeah, homework four, part, part A, okay? Now you want to take that equation and you want to convert it to a transient calculation, okay? I mean, if you really think about what modifications you have to do, it's, it's probably going to take you less than 15 minutes, okay? Here is all you have to do, you have to say, Whatever my diagonal is, my diagonal plus one over delta t, okay? Whatever is was my right-hand side, which happened to be the source term only in your problem, okay? It will be that plus these terms. That's all, okay? Now, if you're doing just the plain backward Euler method, you will not even have this term. You will just have that term added to it, okay? So if I, if I think about this, here is what happens. In your code, you say, suppose you have a steady state equation and you want to say that, well, I'm going to convert it to a point where I can run both steady state calculations and transient calculations with it, okay, by just setting a flag, okay? And let's say that flag is called transient, okay? So you say basically this, if transient, okay, 
then my A naught, which is my diagonal, is whatever A naught I calculated for the steady state equation plus 1 over delta T. Okay? My right hand side is whatever right hand side I calculated for the steady state equation plus phi at n i comma j divided by delta t end that's all your code has now become a transient code okay and believe it or not this is what's done in commercial codes okay the transient term is added at the very end using a logic like this where you just modify the diagonal on the right hand side and that's it. Now of course you have to set up the time iteration, the time stepping loop, okay? Uh, that's and then you have to store variables, you know, initial conditions and so forth. Those those are additional uh, things that you have to worry about. But as far as ma modification of the matrix or setting up of the matrix is concerned, uh, the fact that it's a transient equation hardly changes anything. So it's a um, trivial extension to the steady state equations because bulk of the work goes into formulating the coefficient matrix that comes from the spatial discretization, not the time discretization. Okay? Any questions? All right. Um, so here are some of the advantages of this method. No need to assemble and solve the full linear system using an iterative solver. So all this stuff that you've been doing, setting up the Stone's method or CGS method or whatever other method, you don't have to do that anymore. Okay? Method is still implicit in time, which is great, and therefore has unconditional stability. You can use large time steps. Okay? The disadvantage, of course, is that you can only use it for a structured mesh. Okay, so you have to have ordered IJK lines. If you don't have that, then you can't do this splitting. Okay, people have actually tried it for um, unstructured mesh using an idea similar to this. Okay, but they found that the overheads incurred in trying to figure out which cells are swept through and all that because it's now unstructured, right? That's actually more than. Uh, you know, just solving it, solving the elliptic problem within every time step. It doesn't pay off uh, in terms of overheads. Okay. <clears throat> so here's the summary of the method. So step one, of course, again, you set up your initial conditions for all nodes. This is straightforward. And then you do a row-wise sweep of the computational domain solving the following tridiagonal Equation. So this one is basically going from sweep over J okay, if you have a Dirichlet boundary condition at the bottom wall then you don't do J equal to 1 start from J equal to 2 and so on but if you have other boundary conditions start from J equal to 1 uh, and then the next step you do the same thing this is sweep over I Okay. And then once you're done with that, you reset your initial conditions. There is no iteration at all. Okay. You reset your initial condition and then you proceed to the next time step and repeat steps two and three.